Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to First Tamara Presbyterian Church as we continue on this, uh, in this virtual format for our services today. Thank you to everyone who tuned in this morning and to everyone who's been involved in the broadcasting and putting together of our services. I made a couple of announcements this morning with regard to Connect, and just one more that I want to announce. At the minute, you'll see that we're back online again, and so we'll be using some of the praise items that were recorded previously to help us with our online services. And if you would like to be able to get a, a CD, a DVD of those praise items, which are very good, and uh, you can put on the car or, or at home, and also have, that have the one, two, threes from the last time round, I know lots of people contributed to the Christmas one, two, threes, and thank you to each of you who were involved in that. But for the last one, two, threes, and also for those items of praise, the DVDs are still available, and um, the money for which is going towards uh, Adam Urban's work uh, as he church plants in Poland. And so far, I think we've got about £150 in around that uh, region to be able to send to that worthwhile work. It'd be good to send a, a few pounds more. So those are £5 each. Like I said uh, this morning, during these online services, we're going to be reading together for our call to worship from Psalm number 31. And Psalm 31, we read verses 1 to 4, this evening verses 5 to 8. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction and have known the distress of my soul and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my foot in a broad place. We praise God together in our opening praise. And just before we do so, I forgot to say actually this morning, I'll say it now also, please don't forget that if this, during this time of isolation or lockdown, should you need practical supplies or help or a phone call or prayer or any, anything at all, please don't hesitate to get in touch with myself or one of the elders at this time. Let's praise God. My worth is not in what I owe. Not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. Rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. The summer floods we fade and die. Fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. But life eternal close to us at the cross. I will not burst in well for might or human wisdom's fleeting light, but I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross. I rejoice in my my soul. I will trust in him no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. To wonders here that I confess my worth and my unworthiness. My value fixed, my ransom paid at the Rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, 
wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. So as I said this morning, we're going to be locking down and locking in with the Old Testament character Elijah. This morning we set the context as we read from 1 Kings chapter 16, but we're going to be thinking just tonight of 1 Kings 17, and I'm going to read together verses 1 to 7, the same portion we read from this morning. This morning we thought about how Elijah lives for Israel, and this evening we'll think about our second two points. This is 1 Kings 17 verse 1. This is the word of God. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And after a while the brook dried up, because there was no rain in the land. Amen. And we thank God for his word. So this morning, Elijah lived for Israel, and we thought a little bit about how Elijah finds himself in the northern ten tribes of Israel, and Ahab is the worst of all of the kings of Israel. Hence why God has had enough, and God is sending his mouthpiece, God is sending his prophet to speak to Ahab and to the people who are worshipping Baal and not him. Secondly, Elijah lived with ravens. The prophet here must participate in the same judgment that God is bringing to Ahab and to the nation of Israel. They had to live it, just like everybody else. And Elijah is an example of how the people of God, God sent people, had to go through that same experience as everyone else. Elijah didn't just bring the message, turn on his heels, and walk away in the opposite direction, and life for him would be hunky dory. They had to live it out also. And what does God tell Elijah to do? He says, Hide yourself. Depart from here. So after he's spoken to Ahab, depart from here, turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. God's word came to Elijah, but he too had to suffer from the word he brought. He hides, he drinks, he feeds. And this is all difficult. It's difficult for Elijah, just as much as it is difficult for Joe Public living in Israel at this time, just as it's difficult for Ahab and Jezebel living in their grand palace. He not only brought God's word, but he had to live for needy Israel. This moves him. How important is this? How important is this? Living for you, entering your sorrows, entering the sorrows of someone else. Well, certainly I as a minister certainly find that in my job, I have to enter into the sorrows of others. 
when there's death, sickness, calamity, I have to enter sometimes into the sorrows and the situations and the experiences of others. In the same way, Elijah had to enter into the same sorrows as the people who he was ministering to. And even for you as a believer, perhaps tonight listening in, you as a member here of First Jamara, as you think of the needs of First Jamara, the needs of our community, the needs of our country at the minute, are we too not in a time of great need? Are we too not in a time when we need to enter into the sorrow of others? Oh yes, it's good to rejoice with those who rejoice. But Paul says it's also good to weep with those who weep. What does it mean for us now, in January 2021, in a time of isolation, in a time of lockdown, when we hear of people isolating, when we hear of people who have lost loved ones, when we hear of people who are alone, when we hear of people who are going through difficulty, when we know of young people who have just had their <coughs> exam rug pulled from beneath them, we think about ourselves here not being present in worship, not being able to see each other. What does it mean to enter into the sorrows of others? And also, what need we have also to wrestle with God and to plead for mercy, like Elijah did during this time. During this time, hiding beside the brook, he prayed, he wrestled with God, he pleaded for mercy. Oh, if he gave us what we deserved. And yet the word of the Lord came to Elijah. That's what the scriptures say. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Think about it. The man of God, who perhaps thought he was in control. The skies will not give rain until he says so. He goes into hiding because of the word of the Lord. Goes to Cherith, which means separation. Oh, how Elijah, after he delivered the word to Ahab, could have flaunted around, shot his chest out. Oh, Ahab, rain won't come until I say so. And now God separates him. God is humbling Elijah. God is setting him, cutting him away. If you like, he is being refined, molded, formed. Elijah was to be the prophet that God wanted for the great um, contest on the top of Mount Carmel. And yet he's humbled here by lowly cherith. He's fed by unclean ravens. And this is a humbling experience. A raven is perhaps the least bird expected to bring food to Elijah. He was sent to live with ravens who will supply us food. Why is it strange that ravens were the bird chosen to feed Elijah? Well, ravens ate meat. Some other birds who perhaps didn't eat meat could bring meat in their mouths and drop it off with Elijah. And you would say to yourself, well, that's natural. That bird wouldn't eat meat. But a raven, a raven eats meat. And so a raven would eat the meat for itself. In fact, <clears throat> this bird is so unlikely to feed someone else because ravens often don't even feed their own young. So greedy are they for meat and to feed themselves that they let their own children starve. And yet they are the bird they are the vehicle that will supply food for this prophet. Reminds us of Psalm 147, doesn't it? Where it tells us that even the ravens are fed by God's providence. And now they feed Elijah. What does Elijah do? Does he say, no, Lord. I am your prophet. I have appeared to Ahab. I will remain here. What have I got to go into hiding for? 
After all, if anything happens to me, there'll be no rain. I am the safest, most securest man in the land of Israel. Does he defy God? Verse 5. Well, sir, verse 4, you shall drink from the brook. I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Verse 5, so he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. God's word became a conquering word in Elijah's heart. He was willing to obey him. Willing to obey God to the very letter of God's word. What is it that uh, the book of 1 Samuel says? Obedience is better than sacrifice. He went the way of the Lord with freedom. He didn't know what would befall him. Unclean ravens, a drying up brook. Think the first night when Elijah camps out beside the brook. Unclean ravens come along, they swoop past they drop meat. How amazing. How wonderful. Providence. Provideo. The very providence, the very giving of God. Amazing. Every morning he would see God's faithfulness. Elijah's being humbled. I wonder during our time of humbling, perhaps, even as we're absent from this building, in our humbling, can you look and see that God gives us tokens of his faithfulness? Count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. It's no mistake that we as a congregation haven't observed the sacrament of communion since the first lockdown. Because you can't do communion socially distant. You can't do it online. And so if you like, we are a starved people. We are a parched people. We are hungry and we are spiritually tired. We need the nourishment and the food that comes from sitting around God's table. But even as we are starved of that and until we can do it again, it is my belief that we can't do it until we are back firmly around the table again as we should be and it is God teaching us that we need to depend on him. He is humbling us. But even until then, we can see how he has blessed us. We can see how he blesses us. We can see how he drops the meat from the mouth of the raven into our lap. <clears throat> He's given us so much. Even in the midst of our humbling, we can see the trinkets, the tokens of God's faithfulness. When God humbles us and we see what we deserve, even an unclean raven is a blessing. We see the faithfulness of God in everything, even in this. Sometimes the small things, what we think are small things, are indeed the greatness and the goodness of God. This virtual way of doing things Oh, if we didn't have it. Can you imagine if coronavirus existed 20 years ago? Could we have done this? You could probably very well be sitting at home on your Todd on the Lord's Day, where a minister could very well just say, take out your Bible and read a portion to your family. Indeed, even this is the goodness of God. He doesn't receive excess either. What does Elijah have? He has enough for each day. God does the feeding, and it is well. It is, it is well. Oh, how it's more valuable to have crumbs from the raven than to have a feast in the palace of Ahab. Yes, more valuable to have crumbs from the mouth of the raven than to feast in the idolatrous palace of King Ahab, because these crumbs are sufficient. These crumbs are life-giving. These crumbs are valuable. These crumbs show the faithfulness of God, and it comes from him. 
and they mean everything. Better the little of the righteous than the abundance of the wicked. It's not a, a text for us. Better the little of the righteous than the abundance of the wicked at this time. Do you know what it is to be fed by ravens? Yeah, you do. Do you know what it's like to be humbled and see the goodness of God and to see how he sustains you in times of humbling as he is now? Yet there's another trial. Verse 7. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Thirdly, Elijah lived by a brook. This is Elijah's calling. It's been self-humbling so far. But now, the challenge. He's told to go and live by the brook. The ravens will feed. The brook will, will quench your thirst. But how challenging now, because the brook dries up. The challenge the authenticity, the authority, if you like. But now we see the authenticity of Elijah's task. The brook goes dry. Ha! Elijah, if you're God's prophet, why is the brook dry? So might the voice of Satan appear in his ear. So might a scoffing bystander. So might a critical cynic watching in tonight or listening or in your family. Someone who taunts you for your faith. We have those voices, don't we? We have those urges. We have those people that will come along and speak such things. Oh, Elijah, if you're God's prophet, why is the brook dry? Who do you think you are? Ah, your God has forsaken you. Where is Elijah's God? Maybe we think that at the moment. In the midst of all going on, as we think of the death numbers, as we think of the pressure on the NHS, as we think of being absent again from this place, where are you, God? Where is Elijah's God? Where is your God? How do we live by a dry brook? Well, we know that faith is not by sight. And even when the brook is dry. Do you know what this means spiritually? Perhaps you've dried up financially. Perhaps you've dried up spiritually. Perhaps there's such problems in your home or in your relationships. You've made bad decisions and bad choices. More and more the brook beside you runs dry. Where is God? Is he here? Does he answer? Has he forsaken me? Where is my God beside the drying brook? Indeed, we all have situations and circumstances that are not easy. People are making decisions at the moment, and they're not easy. I fully recognize that the Northern Ireland Executive, that the British government, that the uh, uh, assembly buildings for the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, even indeed the Kirk session here, anyone in a position of authority is making difficult decisions at the moment. And it's not easy. Things are changing day by day. The NHS, chief medical officers, scientific advisors, it's not easy. Parents homeschooling, parents having to know what to do with their children every day, teachers in schools doing lessons, businesses. It's not easy. There may appear to be a drying brook. And yet, Elijah might still have the meat from the ravens. But meat without water. Maybe you think to yourself, just like Elijah, receiving meat and no water. God takes care of some things but not other things. Oh, he's with me in this adventure, but not in my family. 
He's with me perhaps in my friendships, but not in my other relationships. God, perhaps you think, takes care of one and not the other, blessing you in one way and not in another, and you can't understand. We don't know the mind of God and everything, but here are perhaps reasons why the brook goes dry. The first is this. God wants Elijah to rest not on his promises, but on him, the promiser. He wants Elijah and us to rest, not necessarily on his promises, but on the promise giver. In other words, we can sometimes value the benefits more than the benefactor. We can trust more in the gifts rather than the giver. Do we do that with God? Yes, we do. We rely on what he gives. We rely on what he bestows. We rely on what he promises rather than on him himself. We want more of what he gives rather than more of him. We want this rather than this. Is that real of us? Yes, it can be. We want more of this and this rather than this. We need to rest on the promise giver rather than the promise itself. How else might the brook run dry? Well, I believe God, God is teaching Elijah. God is teaching Elijah here. And it is righteous and it is just for God to dry up Elijah's brook because Elijah is like us. Sometimes when we read stories in Scripture, we think of Elijah and Noah and Joseph, and we think these are sinless men. Oh, how we should be like them in every way. And indeed, we are called to emulate them. The Scriptures tell us there's only one man that lived a perfect life. He lived a life such as us, yet without sin. And that is Jesus. And so Elijah here is like us. He is a sinner. And God needs to strip us, as he needed to strip Elijah, of unrighteousness. And we need to learn that actually we deserve nothing. What is it the hymn writer says? Nothing in my hand I bring, but simply to thy cross I cling. We need to realize that we bring nothing to God. God brings you to this point to be content in him and on him alone, being empty-handed and coming to him in an empty-handed way, not bringing you and your gifts and all that you have, but coming as an empty vessel for God to pour himself into you. being empty, so we can cling to him. And this is grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. So he gets the glory. Him and not us. This is grace. In John chapter 11, we read of Jesus and Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And Mary and Martha are in hysterics. They've sent for Jesus to come. Their brother Lazarus is on the brink of death. Come quickly. They implore him. They beseech him. You can do something about this. Come now. Their brook is running dry. Their brook is a trickle. Please come. Lazarus dies. Their brook went dry. And Jesus says to them, at that point, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And glory comes to him from the raising of sick Lazarus. And he gets the glory. Verse 8, we haven't read it. We'll look at it next week. After all of this, after a while the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land, then verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to him. 
I think on the authorized version it says, the word of the Lord came on to Elijah the second time. <coughs> After he has spent time at the dried up brook, God comes the second time. Yes, he will take care of you when your brook runs dry. He will never desert his saints. He will uphold you with his righteous right hand. Elijah here is now prepared to stand for God on the top of Mount Carmel as God's representative. God takes away to make us, to build us up, to make us more like him, to make us what he'd have us to be. John says in John 3, what is it must happen? He must increase and we must decrease. A time of testing for this prophet at this time. Lessons we can learn. Elijah lived for Israel. Elijah lived with ravens. Elijah lived by a brook. Let's come together to God now in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this story from your word. And then maybe it's a, a story that we've never taken the time to study. We see Elijah with strength appearing before the pagan king. We see how he enters into the pain and the sorrow and the suffering of Israel. We see how he is blessed with the meat that comes from the mouth of the raven and how his problems escalate even more when the brook dries up. But even in the midst of it all, you're there. And maybe we find ourselves perhaps tonight in a situation like Elijah, where we think our brook has dried up. The streams of your blessing and your abundance seem to have run dry. But Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we can trust not in the brook, but we can trust in the God of the brook. We can trust in the one who provides, the one who gives, the one who provides all things through your word. You provided salvation and saving through your son, the Lord Jesus, who we can come to tonight and trust in for the days ahead. Oh Lord, may we through the studies of the life of Elijah see that you are the same God who could help the land of Israel in the midst of drought and famine. And you, Lord, can help Canaan, First Jamara, Northern Ireland, the United Kingdom, we today, in this world, even in the midst of a pandemic. Continue, Lord, to grant much by way of great grace to those who might feel as if their brook has dried up. We pray, Lord, for the Prime Minister, we pray, Lord, for his government. We pray, Lord, for the first and deputy first ministers of our own devolved assembly. We pray, Lord, for our own health minister, our own education minister, for those who might this week have felt like their brooks have dried up. We pray, Lord, for school principals. We pray, Lord, for church leaders. We pray, Lord, for doctors and nurses, for those at the front line in the NHS. We pray, Lord, for those who have family members with the coronavirus, or who, or who even have lost loved ones to it, who might feel as if their brook has dried up. Lord, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of this parched and scorched land, might we be able, like Elijah, to say, then the word came a second time. Might we have the strength, and might we be endued from above, to seek which comes from you. Make us what you would have us to be. Decrease a sense of self and increase a sense of God, a sense of Jesus, a sense of grace, a sense of purpose, a sense of love. Father, thank you once again. We can turn to your word. Might it help us despise and kill sin and look all the more to you and to the day in which you appear. Keep your hand of protection upon us and those who we love. All to the praise and honour of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing praise, we continue in worship.
Once again, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you at half past 11 on Facebook Live and on YouTube and via the CD or DVD next week. Let's pray. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.